Okay, we're now recording. Um, so this is a UNCG Libraries Research and Application Webinar on Public Opinion Polling the Basics by Rachel Olson, our social sciences librarian, and Rachel will uh, get us started and introduce herself. Thank you, Rachel. All right, thank you. Hi, everybody. So I am Rachel Olson. Um, I want to introduce myself. <laughs> I'm our first year communication and social sciences librarian, and I have a lot of areas that use public opinion polling as part of the, like, the research that students are doing. Um, but I will say that these polls and these resources have um, implications for everybody. Um, like every, I think researchers in pretty much any field could, could find some use in these resources. And I've seen uh, them find some use in these resources, even folks who are more humanities focused. So um, I also wanna start with a disclaimer. The slides are not cooperating with me, one moment. Um, I also want to start with a disclaimer that I am not a survey methodology expert. I would love to be. I think it's an incredibly interesting field. I've done a little bit of coursework on it, hope to do more in the future, but I, this is not a talk about survey design and survey methodology. Um, I will talk about a couple very basic things about it, but I encourage you to learn more. I'm happy to show you resources on it if you are interested and um, happy to talk about it. Does anybody have questions before we get started? Okay. So here's what we're going to cover. <clears throat> um, what are public opinion polls? Uh, who conducts them? Why are they important? Why should we care? I also added in a section on just briefly how to evaluate polls when you're using them in your own research. Um, some questions to consider. And then I'm going to show you three uh, resources for public opinion polling. Um, one of them, <clears throat> Roper Center iPoll, we have a subscription to here at UNCG. It's the only one that is subscription based, though. The other two are freely available to anyone online. Um, and these are by no means the only resources available um, related to <laughs> public opinion polling out there, there are dozens. Um, so this is just a quick demo of three that I have chosen. Okay, this is a long slide. Basically, what I'm trying to show you here is what is a public opinion poll? So it has to do, um, it is a survey. It is designed very carefully by people who have extensive training and how to design surveys. And we'll talk about that um, because there's a lot that goes into it more than you might think. Um, and these are specifically designed to measure the public's views, the public's opinions um, on particular issues. This is very important. The people who take these polls are chosen at random. It's called random sampling, um, which basically means that everybody in the population being studied has an equal and non-zero chance of participating. It means not only do you have a chance, you have the same chance as everybody else in that population. And that is extremely important. That's what a lot of methodology on survey research like hinges on. It must be random. Well there are things called convenient sampling. I, I think that if you're going to do a true um, experiment, anyways, getting into qualitative, quantitative research a little bit, it's important in public opinion polls as much as possible to conduct random sampling, although it is not the only type of sampling that exists. Um, and then you want your samples to be representative as well. You want it to, what that means is that if we're interested in what people in the United States think about a particular issue, um, we obviously can't go out and survey everybody in the United States on that issue. We don't have the time, we don't have the resources. And these polls are conducted all the time, daily, many of these polls. Um, so in order to get it done more efficiently, um, we have representative samples um, and we'll talk about what that means. We're gonna watch a very short video on it. Um, and those allow you to make generalizations about the population that you're studying without having to um, actually talk to every single person. So. This is a video, I really like it. It's from Pew Research Center, which we're gonna talk more about. Um, and it is, <clears throat> I think it's three minutes long and it talks about random sampling and also representative sampling in a way that I think is really helpful. So I'm gonna start it. And if someone would just put in the chat whether or not you can hear it, that would be very helpful. So how can a survey of a small group of people measure public opinion of the entire United States? 
This idea is called random sampling, where instead of talking to everyone in the population, you talk to a group of people who represent the entire population. Of course, if you want to measure what the entire nation thinks, you can't just stand on a street corner and wave people over. That type of haphazard sample would only represent the people near that street corner at that particular time, and you wouldn't get the people that didn't necessarily want to talk with you. A nationally representative survey requires a random sample in which each person in the United States had a chance of selection. Survey researchers have spent decades perfecting methods to draw a truly random sample that includes all ages, all incomes, all ethnic and racial backgrounds, and all political persuasions. We actually use random sampling all the time in everyday life. For example, when you're making soup, if you stir the pot correctly, you don't have to drink the entire pot of soup to know if it needs more salt. Instead, you can just have a spoonful because each spoonful tastes like the pot of soup overall. That's random sampling. So once you have your random sample, how can you ensure that it actually represents the overall population? A sample could differ from the overall population because some people are more likely than others to take surveys. So pollsters use a standard technique called weighting to adjust for differences. We know the demographic composition of the United States thanks to data from the US Census Bureau. So once we have our sample, we compare the respondents' demographics to the makeup of the whole country. We look at things like age, gender, education, race, and region. Weighting allows us to adjust our survey data so that it matches the general population on these characteristics. So because of random sampling and weighting, we can take something small like a survey sample and use it to describe something much larger, like the attitudes of all US adults. So that's the video from so how you know, can a from Pew Research. I really like it. I think it explains um, <clears throat> random and representative sampling kind of nicely. We'll talk more about how what Pew Research Center is and how they do that work um, and a little bit more about what your chances are of being chosen here in a minute. Does anybody have questions, comments before we go on? Feel free to drop it in the chat or um, unmute yourself. Totally up to you. If not, that's okay. Okay. <clears throat> so why are public opinion polls important? <coughs> so obviously, <coughs> excuse me, because we can't measure the entire population, it tells us what proportion of the population has a viewpoint on a particular issue. Um, and it's helpful because we can quickly learn how people in general are probably thinking and feeling on a particular issue. It can also help folks who do not have a big platform um, get their voices heard. So I'm not a Kardashian. I can't log on to Instagram, make my point known and have 150 million people read it and digest it, right? So taking a poll is one of the ways that I have, one of the, one of the tools that you have to help make your voice heard. So <clears throat> if you are approached about taking a poll, I would encourage you to do it. So here are some questions to consider. Um, when doing a survey, and these are questions that places like Pew Research Center and Roper and 538, all these places consider. I actually got some of these from Pew Research Center. So one of the major things you want to do is avoiding jargon. So for instance, in libraries, I know what weeding is. Um, weeding is a term that we use to describe when we remove books from a collection for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, most people especially those who aren't librarians probably don't know what that word means, that's jargon. Um, so I wouldn't wanna include the word weeding in a survey question to library patrons who aren't librarians, right? Um, you also don't wanna to offer too much information. So in my explanation, if I have to ask patrons a question about weeding um, and I wanna explain what it means, I don't wanna to be too wordy about it either because I think that uh, there, there is some evidence to show that the longer people have to spend reading your question and trying to understand it, it can have an impact on um, their answer and even whether or not they answer. You wanna avoid leading questions. You want to allow people to, um, you wanna really get at how people feel. So you don't wanna pull them toward a particular answer. You don't want to prime people. You don't want to push people. Um, you need to make sure that your questions are ask what you need to ask, get to the point, offer just the right amount of information, um, and don't have people leaning one way or another by the way you've written the question. 
no double negatives. And um, I can talk more about what this means, but basically <coughs> double negatives in a survey question is not a good thing because it can confuse people um, as to what you are actually asking. Um, and you wanna get diverse reviewers. So what that means is when you're gonna send out a survey, when Pew Research Center sends out a survey, they have people whose entire job it is to review these survey questions and to make sure that they make sense, to make sure that they are answerable and that um, we're gonna get the kind of results that we want to get. Um, there are plenty of other considerations when you're forming survey questions. Does anybody know any of them? I can tell you one. Um, while you're thinking, you don't want double-barreled questions, which means asking two questions in the same question. Um, you want to break those up into single questions. Does anybody know of any other ones? That's okay. Yeah, I, these are these are some of the main ones. And I think, again, if you take a class on survey methodology, they can give you entire books have been written on this. So um, here, I think more importantly for most people, here are some questions to consider when you are viewing a poll, when you are, especially if it's a poll that you are maybe planning to incorporate into your research. Um, what's the source of the poll? Where did it come from? Just like any other source, you want to know where it came from. How many people were polled? when and where did the polling take place? Um, those are two really important ones. Who conducted the poll? What questions were asked? And how were the questions phrased? These are some main things to think about. Um, <coughs> excuse me, and we can talk about them a little bit more if you want. Um, <clears throat> I also think the context of the poll is really important, thinking about when, not only when and where it was conducted, but why it was conducted. Um, thinking about what is happening politically, um, in the world. If you asked people, <clears throat> if you asked people a year ago how they felt about Vladimir Putin as a leader, um, right, in 2021, you would have gotten one answer. Whereas today, if you ask people how they felt, given the fact that he has invaded Ukraine, I would imagine the answers would be quite different. So thinking about that as well. Um, thinking about political motivations for, for conducting a poll. Um, <laughs> and you want to think about how the poll is going to be used. Polling data gets taken out of context all the time. Excuse me, I'm sorry. It gets taken out of context all the time um, and reported in ways that aren't necessarily appropriate or, um, you know, completely uh, representative of what the, what the data actually means. So if you think of any other questions you might want to consider, definitely um, feel free to drop them in the chat. I think these are some of the main ones. There are um, certainly more, um, but these are. this is a good starting point, I think, for researchers who are interested in using this polling data. <clears throat> so thinking a little bit more about polling, um, there are uh, associations like the American Association of Public Opinion Research that are, um, it is their purpose to help guide people who are doing public opinion polling. And they have this page, we go out to it, actually takes us to an ethics, a code of ethics for um, professional um, public opinion researchers in the same way that there are codes of ethics for professional journalists, things like that, like rules that um, you are generally, other people in your, in your profession would expect you to um, abide by. And I think when we're doing surveys, it's really important because there are things about privacy. How are you going to protect these people's identities, um, especially when you're collecting information about them, like demographic information? Um, <clears throat> thinking about how you recruit people, like if we look at this condemned survey practices um, page, this is really helpful things that you absolutely should not do. Um, requiring money, for instance, offering products or services for sales, and then, for instance, using the contact information of your participants to, like, have what they call leads in sales, where you come back and offer to sell them something. Um, definitely revealing identities is a big no-no. Um, yeah, if you're, if you haven't done random selection, there's a big problem there. Um, I think also, they do talk about IRB, Institutional Review Boards. They give some advice on how to do that. Um, most institutions have an IRB. Um, UNCG certainly does that when you are proposing to do research, 
um, they will review your proposal and give you some feedback. It's, it's to protect you and it's also to protect the university from liability and to protect the participants in your study. So um, the AAPOR talks about this. It's really fascinating stuff if you are interested in digging into it a little bit. It has a lot of do's and don'ts for these, um, these types of researchers. And then Pew Research FAQs, I just find it really interesting personally. So they talk about, without going into it, they talk about um, common questions that they get. So one of the most common things that people wanna know is why do I never get chosen for polls? Um, and the reasoning that they give, which makes some sense to me, is if you take all of the people in the United States who are adults and who are not institutionalized, meaning they are not imprisoned, they are not in long-term care facilities, anything like that, um, if you took all of those people, it equals about 255 million. And their average survey pool um, is about 1,500 people. So if you take 255 million people in the United States divided by 1,500 that are actually gonna be chosen, your chances are about one in 170,000 of being chosen for one of these polls. Um, so that's why most of us probably have not had our, uh, had been asked about this. You also have to think about the type of people who take polls, the type of people who are likely to answer the phone um, when a pollster calls and talk to them. Um, you are you want to think about the type of people who are going to sit there and do a web-based survey or talk to people on a street corner, um, because there are definitely people who are more likely to want to share their views than others, right? Um, there's also um, <clears throat> people will very often volunteer or want to volunteer to be polled. Um, and that doesn't work with random sampling. So Pew has a really nice way of putting it and explaining why um, they appreciate that, but <coughs> you cannot volunteer to be part of a study. So it's really interesting stuff. And I will give Sam the link to these slides um, if people wanna read more about that. So there are three resources that I just wanna briefly demo here. Um, related to public opinion polls, um, only the first one, oops, only the first one is subscription based, like meaning that it costs money, but UNCG has a license, so it's free for all of our users. Pew Research Center at 538 are freely available online. Like I said earlier, I'm going to start with Roper Center iPoll after I blow my nose one more time. Sorry, everyone. Um, so Roper Center iPoll was founded in 1947. It is at Cornell University up in Ithaca, New York. Um, it is their new archiving of polling data. And you can, as we'll see, you can see both questions and response breakdowns. Um, you can get information about studies. So I'm gonna click into it, UNCG Access. I clicked straight into it just now. If you are just doing this on your own and wanna to get to it, you go to library.uncg.edu, click databases, and it is under R, and it says Rober iPoll. Um, and if you are using it off campus, yeah, I think you do have to complete a new registration. I'm off campus right now, so we're gonna test that theory. Um, so I'm gonna actually log in with the account I made yesterday and hope that it works. One moment. Hopefully it remembers me. Of course not. Okay. Well, you can log in and you can save things and you're able to do kind of some advanced features and you do have access to that feature through UNCG. So if this is a resource you're interested in playing with, um, you can certainly do that. And, and I would encourage you to do that. So let's say that I was doing a paper on, I don't know, for some sort of current politics class on the war in Ukraine. And I wanted to see what people are saying, how people are feeling about the war in Ukraine. I'm going to do um, <clears throat> keyword Ukraine interview dates 2022 to 2022. And that's going to limit it um, because it's probably not the first time that people have asked people how they feel about Ukraine in the past. I'm sure there were polls. And it didn't seem to like this. So let's try that one more time. I'll try it without the years. Okay, so there are 397 polling questions related to this. Um, we can limit on the left side. Over here, we can limit by interview dates. I want to see things first to today's April 7th. And that takes it down to 53. So knowing um, 
if you were doing something like a current events research and you wanted to to pick something for a reason like this, um, knowing at least the approximate time frame that you're interested in is helpful. So you can see here, um, the newest, it sorts automatically by newest. So the most recent poll we have is about a month ago. Um, when, it comes to the, when it comes to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, do you think the United States is providing too much support, not enough support, or about the right amount of support? Um, and you can see that this is a Pew Research Center poll conducted by Ipsos, which Ipsos is a market research company. So, you can see the results here. What I find more interesting than the results is the survey information. So you can see they conducted this poll over about a week. Um, they talked to adults in the United States. Again, that's 255 million people. Um, of that, their sample size was about 10,000. So this is a larger than normal poll for Pew. Um, and it was a web-based survey, so taking it online. Um, and there are obviously advantages and disadvantages to taking polls online. And you can see the results, how people responded. Um, so the way that this gets used is, OK, we have a poll put together by a relatively authoritative source um, and distributed by professionals in market research. So I could feel relatively confident as a student or anyone doing reporting on this, um, potentially taking that and putting it into my paper. And I could say something like, in a recent poll, 42% of Americans indicated that they believe the United States is not providing enough support to Ukraine. And that's where a lot of those things come from. A lot of those, um, when you'll see it, uh, in papers and news reports on social media, when people talk about X percent of people believe this or X percent of people believe that, ask yourself these questions and ask the person who posted it these questions if you can. Where did you get this information? How do we how do we know um, that this isn't just you know a poll that they did of of their friends, right? And Roper is kind of cool because you can copy it. Um, you could copy the question text. You can, again, if you log in, they have, you can save it to folder. So I could create a folder called Ukraine and save these. Um, you can also download uh, different file types with all this information in it. Um, and it shows you actually where this data got used. So two days later, Pew Research published a report featuring this data. Um, another thing that I really like about, oops, sorry, Roper Center, is that they show you this particular question within the context of all the questions in that particular study. So I can look and see, okay, in what order did we ask people these questions? Um, when did this, you know, did this come earlier or later in the survey? What else were we asking about? They were asking about Katanji Brown Jackson in the same study. So they were, they were asking about multiple things, not just Ukraine. So that's important information to keep in mind. You can cite the study, although, <laughs> kind of silly. They're still on APA 6 and MLA 8, which is not correct because we've both we've moved on on both those styles. But anyway, it's there if you want to try it. Um, does anybody, <coughs> excuse me, have any questions about Roper iPoll before we move on? That is the tip of the iceberg in terms of what you can do with Roper iPoll. I would be happy to um, show people anything that they would like to see or talk to folks. Yeah, I think it's a cool resource, um, and it you know I've been up to Cornell and seen the building where they do this, and it's I, I mean it's cool. It's a neat resource. They have things for um, teachers. I think it's more well. They know they have lesson plans for um, both uh, high school and college here. They have some you know things that they have some evidence. Uh, excuse me, undergrads that have worked for them in the past have produced. Uh, materials and projects. They give you a couple things that you could potentially look at. I think the workshops thing is kind of cool. So if we wanted to do something about um, Roper Center specifically, and wanted to have people practice, they have like some questions about these specific subject areas where you could go in and use their polls to find the data to answer the questions. So um, if you're interested in that, let me know. Or if there's any faculty watching this that want to incorporate some of this into your um, 
into your courses, happy to talk to you about that. They also get into things like SPSS, um, which I am not proficient in SPSS, but we have librarians who are. So um, if you're interested in that as a professor, feel free to ask. All right, so yeah, right away, where did you get to that classroom materials? Yeah, so if you're in the database um, <clears throat> and you click on, it's, it says learn right here and then classroom materials. Thank you. Yeah, and they have, I mean, they have a ton of really cool stuff. They have like talking about how to use data sets. I really like these. So Ropers, they have some tutorials, polling and public opinion. Oh yeah, so this is like pioneers of polling. It's people who have made significant contributions to polling and survey methodology. So you could learn more about that. I think it has some cool uses for, um, you know, teaching at all different levels. So I was very impressed. Pew Research Center, um, just quickly, is a DC-based think tank. And I want to point out that think tanks are very tricky. So if there are any researchers watching this and you come across places that tend to call themselves think tanks, use with caution, contact a librarian, look it up, see what you can find, because a lot of them will say like the, I don't know, they'll call it the Center for American Rights. I just made that up. Or the, or the um, Center for Research on Climate Change. I don't know if that's a real organization. Whenever you see something like that, that calls itself a center or a, any kind of, I don't know, any kind of group, I highly recommend that you look up the Wikipedia page for that group um, and see what it has to say, excuse me. The decongestant is working everyone. Um, see what they have to say on Wikipedia because very often it will tell you if there are um, political affiliations and political leanings. Wikipedia is also great because it will tell you about the funding for these organizations. Thinking about who funds polls is really, really important. For instance, if we took a survey on cigarette use, or if we were looking at survey data from something about cigarette use, and we saw that it was funded by uh, R.J. Reynolds, right, or Marlboro or something, that is a huge red flag because that research is funded by an organization that has a vested interest in people feeling one way about that particular subject. Anyway, Pew Research Center is not one of those. It is funded by the Pew Charitable Trust. Um, a lot of really great information about methods and tools here. Um, <laughs> what I encourage people to do is to explore their research topics page. You can go to research topics and click full topic list. And you can see they have entire pages on uh, different things here. So I'm just going to randomly choose one. I am going to do, I'm trying to think of something that won't be a huge downer. <laughs> um, I'm going to do gender and tech. So they have, um, they've organized, curated their, their research and their studies into these topic pages, which can be really helpful. Um, and you can see, I think it is published in order of most recent stories, although it could be wrong about that. And you could see um, if there's any sort of um, related material there. What I like about Pew Research is most, if not all of their studies now have a how we did this um, tab, which is great because it basically gives you the methods. It says, here's when we did it, here's how many people we surveyed, um, here's how we recruited them. Um, the margin of sampling error, which is something we could spend a tremendous time, amount of time talking about, but we won't. Um, that's a whole thing in survey methodology. I like that Pew gives you nice visualizations of the data. It also doesn't just expect you to understand um, its graphs and charts like this. Um, to me, I could probably read it and understand it, but um, if, if you're not a visual person, if that doesn't really work for you, they do have explanations of it, which accompany the charts, which I find really helpful. Um, and what I like about Pew is that they don't take policy positions. They're not here to tell you what to believe. They're just saying, here's a study we did. Here's the results that we found. Um, draw your own conclusions. So because we're short on time, I'm not gonna go too much into this, but I will say most of their reports can be downloaded excuse me, can be downloaded. Um, they also have entire sections on, they keep this section in the upper right um, based on what's going on in current news. They know that a lot of people are wanting to know about this right now, so they keep it up there. Um, 
this is encouraging seven in ten americans now see russia as an enemy that was sarcasm um so you could dig into this if you were interested and they do these polls quite often. I meant to say with Roper Center, they update their archive daily. Um, so these polls are literally happening all the time. Um, very quickly, I'm gonna talk about 538. And one thing to be aware of with 538 is that it is owned by ABC News, which is owned by Disney. So that is important to note. Um, if you were aware of any particular stances that Disney has on the issues that you're researching, it would be important for you to try and determine that before using 538. But I think it's important to talk about it because it's popular. And just because the resource is popular doesn't make it good, but I think it's important for us to be able to understand and use these popular resources. I personally find that 538 does what I need it to do well enough that I, I feel it is uh, mostly trustworthy. If you're doing course research, um, I would maybe encourage you to stick to Roper or Pew, but that's not necessarily true for everything. Like, do they do a lot of sports work? But I know during um, presidential elections, people lean on 538 very heavily. Um, 538, by the way, this is the number of electoral college votes that are up for grabs during presidential elections. That is where the name 538 comes from. So, um, it started in 2008, and they have things organized this way. You can see, I'm going to look at this approval poll, how popular is Joe Biden, and you can see it over time. I will say that um, both Pew and 538 are very, um, there's a lot there about the data, and there's a, lot of, there's a lot of cool stuff that you can do in terms of visualizing the data and, and sort of taking a look at it. So it's interesting, you can manipulate it in different ways. Um, but yeah, I will say that 538 tends to be very popular when there are presidential elections going on. Um, I was gonna see if I could find that section. Let me do a site search real quick, 538.com, 2020 election. Yeah, they do a lot of election forecasting. Um, yes, so I, remember using this in the 2020 election, um, they were talking about, they did a bunch of different modeling and forecasting, and they used that to update who they thought would win the election and to give some um, justification for that. By the way, this guy, there's this little mascot, his name is Fivey, and I love him, he's very cute, Fivey Fox. Um, and so they were updating these constantly. They did tons of different simulations. I like all their different data visualizations because I think it's an interesting exercise in seeing what, um, uh, just seeing what is possible with data visualization. Although I'm not a data visualization librarian, not an expert on that, I just think it's cool. So that is a very, I mean, again, tip of the iceberg with all three of these resources. You could do hour long plus uh, workshops on all of them. There are just three that I find interesting. So anybody have questions or any public opinion polling resources that you like to use that I didn't talk about? It's okay if not, that just tells me that I did a great job. Just yeah, I think it was a great job. <laughs> great. Um, I have no, uh, questions and I am probably going to um, write an email to math faculty about some of this stuff. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And it's not the only, um, I think we may have some other databases that do polling data. I'm sure Lindsay or Joe might also be aware of some of those as well. So yeah, I'm going to stop sharing. Um, yes, Pew Research, love it. I've used it many times. I used it in my master's paper in library school. So, okay. So Shelby and Anna, you can fill out this form to let us know how Rachel did. Um, and this is the last webinar of the um, season. So we, you know, usually in, the, in these um, webinars, you get a follow up with like the next webinar, but this is the last one. Um, I will say the next one that's about, that I know of um, going around is that there is ADAPT pre-conference stuff going on today, uh, right after this at 12, if you would wanna go on active student engagement. And then there's one on Monday um, where it's a panel of um, faculty who are um, experienced in online teaching. So uh, be sure to check that out. And then um, ADAPT is in May. 
Um, and then of course for library people, there's ULVLC stuff. So stay tuned and thanks Rachel. I'm sorry you didn't feel good, um, but it was great. Um, you did it. Yeah. Thank you. And, uh, we'll see you all soon. Thank you all. Have a good rest of your day. Bye everyone. Thank Bye. You.